On February 24th, 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine. Now we all know what can happen when European nations go to war with each other and the impact these sorts of wars usually have on the global order. It's hard to say what the future of Europe will be due to this war and how much this could escalate. Nonetheless, its impact on the 21st century will probably be massive and as a part of understanding that impact, we will discuss how the various Middle Eastern nations have reacted to the outbreak of this war. To begin, I'm going to start with an area of the world near and dear to our hearts where there are no problems and everyone loves each other, fully secure in the lack of controversy they engender. Israel and Palestine. Now, Israel is one of the powers in the Middle East that we can put solidly in the Western camp. Its greatest ally, the United States, sends it billions of dollars a year in military and economic aid. And the United States is also fiercely pushing against the Russian invasion of Ukraine via arms and sanctions against Russia. Naturally, the assumption would be that Israel matches the United States, but in reality, it hasn't been willing to take as firm of a stance as the United States. Israel won't join the United States sanctions regime, has not sent its Iron Dome technology despite requests from the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, and has been very prejudicial in its acceptance of Ukrainian refugees, giving Jews eligible for Israeli citizenship priority. This prompted Zelensky to publicly pressure Israel to be more supportive of Ukraine, where Bennett and the Israeli establishment wish to not push Russia too much, citing the desire to maintain a role as a mediator between Russia and Ukraine, as well as a desire to avoid any geopolitical drawbacks concerning the Russian presence in Syria. Zelensky emphatically insists that you can mediate, but not between good and evil. Zelensky, who himself is Jewish and pro-Israel, sees the Russian invasion of Ukraine as comparable to the Holocaust, and the Ukrainian people as those who had in the past saved Jews from the Nazis, and thus are owed reciprocal support. Many were quick to criticize Zelensky for these claims, especially in Israel. To be fair to Israel, which coming from me I know must sound strange, Israelis have shown support to Ukraine via demonstrations. Despite this, Zelensky expects more from Israel, even compared to other Middle Eastern states, since Israel is a Western-aligned nation with an advanced economy unlike, say, Palestine. Now, Palestine has taken a much more neutral stance on this conflict than even Israel has taken. Neither Hamas or the Palestinian Authority have condemned or praised the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The reason for this is that taking sides would be geopolitically disadvantageous for both parties. On the part of the Palestinian Authority, Russia is seen as a counterbalance to U.S. mediation in the peace process. The dictatorship of the PA is still dedicated to pursuing the two-state solution, and its version of the negotiations include the Quartet, a body consisting of the U.S., the EU, the UN, and Russia. The U.S. has historically acted as Israel's lawyer during negotiations, and the recent Trump proposal was a real blow towards PA and U.S. trust. However, the PA doesn't want to be too friendly to Russia, since it still receives a lot of U.S. aid. Hamas has also taken a neutral stance. It was rumored that Hamas official Khaled Mish'al had condemned the invasion. But this was quickly corrected. Hamas officials have made sure to let everyone know that they were neutral in this war. They view it as a sign of the US losing hegemony over the world and a struggle to redraw Europe's borders. They were, however, quick to criticize the West of hypocrisy for supporting Ukraine 
and not the Palestinian struggle. Hamas's unwillingness to take sides comes from its experience during the Arab Spring, where it supported the rebels in Syria, hoping a sort of Muslim Brotherhood government would emerge victorious as it had in Egypt. This failed and made Hamas have very frosty relations with Assad and indirectly Assad's ally Iran. They've learned their lesson. Situated in the Middle East are the civilization-defining rivers of the Nile in Egypt and the Tigris and Euphrates in Iraq and Syria, which were responsible for creating a surplus of grain that could sustain their respective populations. Well, times have changed. Now many Middle Eastern nations are heavily reliant on importing wheat from other nations, and some receive the majority of their wheat from two countries in particular, Russia and Ukraine. Thus, the beginning of their war has caused a fair amount of panic in countries that import their wheat. Of Lebanon's total wheat imports, they get 80% from Ukraine and 15 from Russia. It's estimated that they have about a month's supply of grain stored left as a result of their main port blowing up during the Beirut blast in 2020. Egypt is the world's largest importer of wheat and gets 80% from Russia and Ukraine. Libya in turn relies on Ukraine for over 40% of its wheat imports. The Maghreb has seen a major drought and countries like Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco are also feeling the sting. Tunisia has already seen high inflation and bread shortages. Algeria has only a six month supply of grain left. Bread is extremely important in these countries. Egyptians get a third of their calories and nearly half of their protein from bread. In fact, it is a staple of the Middle Eastern diet. Without a steady supply, things can get tense. For example, the 70s in Egypt saw bread riots leading to Anwar Sadat and subsequent Egyptian dictators subsidizing bread to ensure their positions. The current revolution in Sudan was sparked by bread prices tripling. These countries are now scrambling for plans to ensure that their population does not suffer too harshly from the grain shortages. Egypt is trying to incentivize its farmers to sell more wheat to their government, giving them more money for the wheat and threatening non-compliant farmers with jail or a fine. Lebanon, which is an especially vulnerable country due to their economic freefall, has resorted to desperately searching for other wheat sellers and accepting food aid from Turkey. Nearly the entire Swana region voted at the UN General Assembly to condemn Russia. Algeria, Sudan, Iraq, and Iran decided to abstain. Morocco just didn't vote, which is odd. I mean, why wouldn't they record a response in a vote to condemn a country that's in the process of annexing a neighboring territory that they don't think should be a sovereign country? Who can say? It who can say? Syria was the only country who explicitly voted against condemnation of Russia. Though I have portrayed how these countries officially recognized governments have voted, it must also be noted that some of these countries have been enduring civil wars and revolutions for the past decade or so, and that complicates things. Syria, for example, is split into competing factions. The government of Syria, headed by Bashar al-Assad, backs Russia, and is reported to be sending some forces over to Russia to help with their invasion. The opposition, however, sympathizes with Ukrainian civilians, who have in turn suffered their own bombardment from Russia. In Idlib, thousands protested against the Russian invasion of Ukraine, citing Putin to be the same monster for Syrians and Ukrainians. In Yemen, the official government condemned Putin but the Houthi rebels instead blamed Zelensky himself for the war, saying it was caused because the country was led by an evil-doing Jew, which, in their mind, naturally brought the country to war. So, you know, do what you will with that very helpful insight from the Houthis. In Libya, the UN-recognized government under one Abdul Hamid de Beba condemned Putin. However, 
Though the fighting of the civil war is over, there is still an unrecognized second power in Libya who has supported Putin, General Khalifa Haftar, who has even promised to send troops to Putin. In Sudan, the government chose to abstain from condemning Putin, but the people who are in the process of actively revolting have shown some inclination towards supporting Ukraine. A Sudanese delegation to Russia entered the country on the 23rd of February, a day before the invasion, and was headed by Hamedi, who is especially hated by the revolutionaries in Sudan. Where Hamedi wants deeper ties with Russia, the Sudanese Professionals Association, an engine of the revolution, sees it as possibly further isolating Sudan during this precarious time for them. Whatever side any country or the opposition in that country has chosen, this war has created a lot of strife and has made the various powers make controversial choices inside and outside the country. So far, in all of these situations, someone loses, but this war is not without winners either. When war began, most of the world was thinking, God, this is terrible. So many people are going to die. However, in Riyadh, probably in a gold palace or whatever, Mohammed bin Salman thought, God, so many people are going to die. What a time to do business. You see, Russia is the third largest producer of oil in the world and supplies 25% of Europe's oil needs and 40% of its natural gas needs. The West has been desperate to plug that hole and a great part of that desperation has resulted in overtures to oil-producing nations in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia condemned the Russian invasion, but has also taken the opportunity to benefit from the war. When Russia invaded, gas prices soared, and the U.S. asked the Crown Prince MBS to increase production of oil to help lower prices. MBS has increased production at the request of Donald Trump during midterm and presidential elections before, but in this instance, he refused. Lowering gas prices could lead to Russia making less money from its energy exports, and thus further the economic warfare that the United States is unleashing upon Russia. But economically, Saudi Arabia is Russia's ally. Iran, on the other hand, has shown willingness to pump more oil. Seeing an opportunity to use their resources to tempt the West should they get the new JCPOA finally approved and the sanctions placed upon them removed, they will return to pre-2018 levels of oil pumping. Even Little Qatar has seen its geopolitical impact increase as it has now been dubbed a major non-NATO ally of the United States and being tasked with partly filling in the energy hole left by Russia. However, the biggest winner of all is Turkey. Turkey was quickly called on to close the Bosphorus to Russian ships and was welcomed by Zelensky in offering itself as a potential mediator. Turkey has also been able to deepen bilateral ties to Greece, with whom they were involved in a standoff over control of their shared sea. And they have been able to take advantage of Europe's new energy demands by leveraging its role as a link in the Southern Gas Corridor, a link of various pipelines exporting energy produced in Azerbaijan through Georgia and then through Tur Turkey. This pipeline can also potentially bring in gas from Turkmenistan, which is on the other side of the Caspian Sea, and is a Turkic state which Turkey is attempting to bring into its orbit. The general mood in the Arab and Muslim world is, in short, very mixed. Where some see the West's hypocrisy in treatment of Ukrainian refugees as opposed to Middle Eastern refugees, others are also aware of a common enemy with Ukrainians in the form of Russia. Where some are now placed with potentially devastating economic burdens, others see an opportunity to advance their own interests. Wherever you lie on this issue, the impact of this war will no doubt be massive. Putting the geopolitical implications of this war aside, it has caused many people to lose everything and become refugees. If you would like to support refugees from this war, please consider donating to a charity linked below in the description.
Um, if you would like to support this channel and ensure that I continue to make videos, please like, subscribe, and most importantly, share. Um, if you would like to uh, help in a more important way, a special way, please consider becoming a patron. If you become a patron, I thank you at the end of my videos, like I'm going to thank my patrons right now. Pyratic Napalm, Adam Elvilia, Avocado Kirby, Tom Rollins, Marshall Law, and Nomad Star. Thank you all for contributing. Uh, and I also do art streams on Twitch. My Twitch is in the description. Please give that a follow. Thank you.